All right, here's my talk on a type in effect system for object initialization. This is a paper that appeared at Uppsala this year, and it has authors Feng Yun Yu, Andre Lotek, Agilus Bibiotis, Paolo Jaruso, and Martin Ledeschi. Most of these authors at EPFL, except for Andre, who is at Waterloo, and Paolo, who is at Delft. So the issue here is that object initialization is hard. It's hard to reason about and it's hard to do. And here's some Scala code, all this, all the examples in this paper are in Scala. And we have this class, hello. It has a field message, which is initialized with hello, and then reads the field name to complete the message. Unfortunately, later, the name field is initialized Alice. And so when you print, then you get hello null, which is probably not the intended behavior. And so object installation today is still a headache for programmers and language designers. That free picture I had has that, and another great expression is right. So here's a roadmap. A presentation point is note that I don't do a generic useless roadmap where it's like, well, here's the introduction, here's the middle, and here's the end. I have a roadmap that contains the things that I want to talk about specifically in this talk. And so the key insight of this paper is about local reasoning and init about initialization. And there's a lot of work that the paper does to enable that. So it puts it into context. There are two requirements and three challenges, which we'll talk about next. Then there's three properties that enable LRI. So weak monotonicity, stackability, and scopability. And the paper talks about how they work in a toy language. Then it pre presents a type system for object initialization. The type system works mostly. It has some limitations. But the main limitation is that it requires a bunch of annotations or else produces a bunch of warnings. And that's bad. So the author has then proposed inference via type and effect system. And they discuss implementation and evaluation. So there's two requirements that the authors point out for this context. The first is that often the this reference is used inside the constructor. I'll show you an example. And the second is creation of cyclic data structures. And so here's an example of what the first thing they have when this is used inside the constructor. And so here's a class, this is fine. And it defines name Alice. So, so far this method is fine. It just returns a value. And then it calls, a, it contains a method which calls this.name. And in fact, it's fine to do that. And empirically, there's a result that 8% of constructors call methods on this. So this is something that the authors have decided ought to be supported. The second requirement is to support the creation of cyclic data structures. And so here we have a cyclic data structure. So we have class parent, and it has a pointer to a child. And then it has a child, which has a pointer to a parent. And the idea is that the system that they're trying to design should allow something like this, but it should ban premature usage of aliased objects. <clears throat> um, there's also another way of doing this that sometimes systems have, which is to have a backbone, which is acyclic, and then additional edges, which are cyclic. But here, there is no restriction. So it's like there's cyclic data structures, and you want to be able to initialize the whole thing. And at there's some point at which the whole data structure is initialized. Uh, before that, you don't want the object to be used in some sense. And so there's th also three challenges associated with this. Virtual method calls, aliasing, and type state polymorphism. And let's talk about what they mean by examples. So here we have a class abstract file and a subclass remote file. And so in these languages, object-oriented languages, usually what happens is that the superclass, in this case abstract file, is initialized first. And then the subclass is initialized second. And so you create a remote file object, and here's what happens. Well, first of all, we initialize the extension field. And the extension field has initializer. And it says, well, call name.substring. OK, so what's name? In the abstract class, it's abstract. So then what happens is we go look at the remote file and it has, which is a this object, 
as opposed to the superclass object. And it has a pointer to fetch the value of local file. Uh-oh, that's a problem because here, local file has not been initialized yet. It only gets initialized after the base object is initialized. And so you have to have some sort of support for virtual method calls in reasoning about these um, initializers, like the one for extension. A second challenge is aliasing. And so the authors point out this, this example of a class. It's kind of pathological, but it points out the, the problem. So there's a field self, which is initialized to this, and then a field n, which is initialized with the value of self.n. And so because we know that self is the same as this, then that's an error. It's pointing to an initialized value. The third challenge is type state polymorphism, as the authors called it. I don't find that to be a great name for it. I probably would have called it something else, but it's not in my paper. And so here the issue is that we have a class C, and what they mean by polymorphism is that no matter what the state of the object, this class, this method G, returns a constant value 100. So it should always be okay to call it. It should be okay to call it no matter what state the class C is in, whether it's uninitialized or is initialized. And so the question is, how do we design a system so that it's always okay to call a method that is not gonna do anything, it doesn't have any accesses to fields in particular. So the main big idea of their paper is to support local reasoning about initialization. And there's some words here, I'll read these words out. In a transitively initialized environment, the result value of an expression must be transitively initialized. And we'll get into what that means part by part. But basically, you have some expression, if everything is, is initialized, then the result of the expression is also initialized transitively. All right, so what the authors do is they break up this into three properties to enable local reasoning. The properties are weak monotonicity, stackability, and scopability. So we'll go into a bit of detail into them now, and then we'll get into more detail a bit later after we give a toy language and semantics. In brief, Weak monotonicity means that initialized fields continue to be initialized. And stackability means all fields should be initialized at the end of the constructor. And scopability is a bit complicated. I'll present it using an example. Let's compare this to the other paper. So weak monotonicity is also a key to the other paper. And the property here is that nothing goes backwards. Nothing goes from being initialized to being non-initialized. The other paper really has to do that as well. Stackability, on the other hand, is something that's different from the other paper. In some sense, the other paper is more flexible and, for instance, permits disjunctions. Well, in this case, everything has to be initialized. Okay, so we described these three concepts by reference to a toy language. And here we'll introduce the notion of operational semantics. And so here we have a formula which is how big step semantics work in some sense. And so what you do when you provide semantics for a programming language is the following. You give the expressions and you say what their semantics are. So here inside these double brackets, we have the expression E. This expression E operates given a certain heap. So the heap is all the, all the, all the memory that's been allocated in terms of objects. The environment, which is all the local variables, and the this value for an object-oriented language. And so when you evaluate an expression, then you get a result and a new heap. So the result is L and the new heap is sigma prime. Okay. So there's a bunch of concepts that the authors introduce using their semantics. And most of these are, or some of these are pretty standard. So the notion of heap reachability in this heap sigma. So we say, five is reachable from two if there is a sequence of directed edges starting at two and going to five. Here we have this two goes to four and then it goes to five. Um, these are called locations in the heap two, four, and five. There's also a definition of being able to reach from a bunch of locations another location. And that's if there's any path from any location. 
So there's object properties which make use of reachability. And so there's three levels of object properties. There's a cold object, which is an object that has been allocated in the heap, but we don't know anything else about it. Then there's a warm object. Warm objects are such that all of their fields are, are assigned. So warm objects are also cold, of course. These are subsets. Um, and then there's a the notion of hot, hot object. So a hot object is a warm object for which all objects reachable from O are also warm. So it's not the case that you have an object which reaches another object which has some unassigned fields. So hot objects are fully initialized for our purposes. Okay, there are some formal definitions. I won't go into them, I've redacted them. And they're, you're not going to be able to get them from this paper, you would have to read the paper. You, you could get them from the paper, you can't get them from the talk. You have to read the paper to find out what they are. But I will say a bit more about two of these properties. So stackability in terms of the object properties that we've talked about before says that all nuclearly created ob objects during the evaluation of expression are warm. So there's a figure in the paper, it gives a picture of a stack and it, this is why this is called stackability. And scopability, I didn't find their description to be very accessible. Um, you can understand it if you know what these things are, but I'll say it in brief. A method may only access pre-existing uninitialized objects through method parameters and this, and not, for instance, through the global scope. So this means that you can't get access to some object that's before you um, unless you do it through ways that you can explicitly see. So then I gave a definition of local reasonable initialization, which was by Muller and Summers. Um, this paper takes that definition and it formalizes it to this bunch of words, uh, which I read before, and more formally to these symbols. And so here we can see the semantics of an expression. And then the other part is if this object is um, hot, then the, um, the, ob the object is hot afterwards. Um, that's not quite right. There's this code of main thing, but we won't talk about that. Okay, so the point of this paper then is to use these definitions and local reasoning of initialization to have a type system. And the type system is going to be a first attempt at talking about local initialization, but it's gonna have some drawbacks as we can see. And in general, I should point out that the point of a type system is that it guarantees that wild type programs never get stuck. So there are certain types of errors that can never occur in a program if a type checks. So I did find the type system in this paper kind of hard to understand. There's a technical report, it's cited in the paper, it's accessible on the internet. It is much longer, it has more details. In particular, it takes the introduction to the type system and splits it into two parts. I also point out that section 3.1 of the paper really should have example of, examples of types and it does not. Okay, so the simplified type system is as followed. A type in their system has a class name component, like class point, and then it has an annotation to this, hot, warm, or cold. The default annotation is hot, but objects may also be during construction, either warm or cold, as we've talked about before. And when you can see these symbols, and basically it means hot is less than warm is less than cold, or is, is a subset of warm is a subset of cold. Right? Let's look at an example of how type checking works. So again, I'm going to proceed by example. So here we have this class parent and this class child, which we've seen before. And so now what we do is we're going to manually annotate in parent the child object with the type warm. And then in the child object, we're going to annotate the parameter to the constructor parent with cold. It's got to be cold because you can't initialize them both at the same time. And so you start by initializing the parent and then you create the child, but the child doesn't have an initialized parent yet. So the next, okay, oh, Here's a digression, I get to do digressions. So here's 
proper LaTeX kerning. So when you're writing LaTeX, and you should be writing LaTeX for technical things like things in this course, what you should not do is use math mode and write dollar sign parent dollar sign. That produces things that are badly current. And so if you closely look at the space between the P and the A, it's kind of wrong. And you look at the space between the R and the E, it's kind of wrong. And so what you should do instead is math it to parent. And that gives you the correct spacing between characters. Okay, that was just a digression. Let's talk about how type systems work. And so what we have is we have these type rules. And so here, what we have is we have rules above the line and rules below the line. And so what this means is that given the things above the line, you can derive the things below the line using the rules in the type system, which I am not presenting to you. And so let's go through this part by part. At the top, you have with an empty environment and with parent being cold, you can always derive that this object has parent cold. The second part of this is there's the rule which says that if you have a bunch of cold parameters and warm, then you can derive mu is warm. What this does is it's taking, it's saying that if you have all the parameters to a constructor being hot, then this would be hot, this first argument to mu, and then that would give you hot. Otherwise, if at least one of them is cold or warm, then it says that the object being created is warm. And so here what we can say is that in this case, if you have the empty set and parent, then you can always write new child this and child has type warm because the parameter this is cold as we have on the left. Now the next line is a derivation for being able to write the field definition um, var c of type child at warm equals new child this. And you can do that if you have the prerequisite here above the line. So you can construct this expression because you know that um, child at warm is a valid type and new child this has that type. Okay, and then the last thing we do is we construct the class definition because the class definition consists of all of the fields that we have declared as valid fields. And so this is a class definition that contains valid fields. So we can type check the definition of the parent class. This is a kind of jumping off the deep end as an example of type derivation, but that's how you do type derivations. Okay, so that's the simple type system and the authors also augment it. And so we had types before, which were either cold, warm, or hot. And they point out, well, look, you also have to be able to permit usage of already initialized fields. So they allow mu to be omega, which is a set of fields. And so when you're type checking a field F, you set the type of this to be C omega I, which is a set of already initialized fields. Okay, there's also more discussion on type state polymorphism and the discipline of authority, things that we're not gonna talk about here. Okay, so there's a type system, it's fine, it works, but it requires a lot of annotation overhead. And the goal is to have as little annotation overhead as possible. And so the authors also propose a type and effect system, which is a programming languages technology, which has existed for a while. And basically it tracks effects for systems. Um, in this presentation, we're gonna give examples, but we're going to admit formalizations um, because you're not gonna get anything out of it, formalization and details. All right, so the idea in an effect system is to track something field access is usually using effects. And in this case, effects are going to over approximate the set of initialized fields. The goal is to guarantee that only initialized fields are accessed. An empty of effect means that no uninitialized fields are accessed. There's a novel concept which the authors introduce for this of potentials. And the motivation here is that you've got to deal somehow with 
potentially uninitialized objects being alias to each other. I'll show you an example on the next slide. So potentials over approximate the uninitialized objects that an expression can evaluate to. For instance, they might have c dot this, c dot this dot f, c dot this dot m are potentials. And so if the potential set is empty, then the object is hot. So there's three types of effects that we're going to talk about. Field access effects, which are represented by exclamation marks, method call effects, diamonds, and promotion effects, up arrows. And so let's talk about field effects first. And the idea between behind field effects is to check that only initialized fields are accessed. And so here's an example of something that is a field access effect. In the paper, there's an example of a bad one where you permute these things and you try to read this.y before you write to it. But in, the case you're, in this case, you're doing a good thing. So we have a definition of m, which is this.y, and this generates a field effect c.this.y. And that field effect is saying, you are going to access field y on object c.this. Also, you have to deal with method calls diamond. And so here we have another example, point. It's always points. And we have x being initialized to the result of this.m, y being initialized to 10, and m being a function which returns this.y. And so this is actually wrong, but you can still express the effects. It's wrong because you call m, m is reading this.y, but this.y is not yet defined at the point of x. It's defined at m, but m is a function, not, not code, not an initializer, right? So it's wrong. Anyway, the effect at x is point.this.m diamond. And then the effect at m is the same as we've seen before, point.this.m. So we replace m diamond with the effects, effects of m at the point where it happens. The last kind of effect is the promotion effect. And we'll show more on the next slide, I think. But the idea here is that we can require a potential to be hot and use it as hot. And so here we have a buffer which is initialized with um, the effect m of calling method m and then a new buffer. And then m is going to promote c dot this because c dot this is um, accessed and that is actually an error. So there's two phase checking. So what we do is we compute effect summaries and potentials for methods and fields. And we check the class constructor to ensure that only initialized fields are accessed, propagating effects associated with method calls. The slide was actually in the wrong order, but there we go. Okay, so the concept behind promotion is directed segregation. So there's part of a heap which is initialized and a part of the heap that's uninitialized. And pointers can go within each of these segregated parts of the heap, but can only go from uninitialized to initialized. And so you promote an object. Um, when you promote an object, you're asserting it's got to be hot and you move the object from the uninitialized space to this initialized space and you stop tracking it. So that's the effect system. Um, so then, yeah, the next slide is actually two-phase checking. And so we do what I said before. And here's promotion. All right, so does this really work? So the authors prevent, present an implementation and an evaluation. So the implementation is available in the production Scala 3 compiler if you run with dash Y checking it. It supports a bunch of things which are at some level implementation details and don't change the fundamental type and effect system. Inner classes, first class functions, traits and properties. But they're presented in the paper as well, just not as part of the core system. There's an evaluation over 17 projects, 600,000 lines of code. And the bottom line is that it produces 0.61 warnings per line, thousand lines of code. The, way, the reason they mentioned it, this is if you have this large code base and you get a zillion errors, then you're not gonna use the system, right? And so you might convince people to use the system as they use it when developing new software, but you have these legacy code bases. Scala has enough legacy code bases 
that if it had produces too many warnings, then the system is um, dead on arrival. Anyway, the warnings are of manually classified eight categories. Um, the number of errors, if you do that multiplication, is order 300. Um, they manually classify these, these categories of warnings. They found nine true positives and two compiler bugs. Okay, and they have related work. We're not gonna talk about that here. And surprisingly, no conclusion. I've actually never seen a CS paper with no conclusion. Math papers have no conclusions all the time, but not CS papers. So I will finish the paper just like that as well. Great. I will talk about the discussion points in the discussion and I will post questions. See you soon.